Matthew chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 33 through 37 in a message I'm entitling The King's Judgment of the Human Heart. But again, we could just as easily call this message the king's judgment on human speech. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we're so grateful for Jesus. Lord, when we read the scripture and we discover that it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When we understand, Heavenly Father, that Jesus is your express communication and that there's a reason why the title word is used to describe Jesus as the express communication of the Father's grace, of the Father's holiness, of the Father's love, And so, Lord, we pray again that our words would be filled with truth, with graciousness. Lord, we pray that our words would be marked by wholesome speech. And so, Father, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Matthew chapter 12. And by the way, Sam, Jonathan did a great job. While in my absence, I'm so grateful for both of them for, and for the whole staff and for all that they do. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 33. Jesus says, either make the tree good and make its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit, brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of his good treasure, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word, that men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you'll be condemned. In the 12th chapter of Matthew, Jesus has repeatedly defended himself against the accusations of the religious leaders. In the opening of the chapter, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. And in the middle of the chapter, he's healed a a man with a demonized heart. The religious leaders suggest that Christ's power comes from Satan himself. And as hard as it may be for some of you to imagine, these are painful words. These are cutting words. They're damaging words. They're untrue words. And even though some of you might be thinking, well, you know, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's going to get over it. Words don't really matter. It doesn't really matter. But nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is going to be reminding us that words matter. Words against Christ can be forgiven upon repentance. In verse 32, remember earlier, in verse 32, Jesus said, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Words against Jesus still hurt him. As they did in Saul's instance in Acts chapter 9 verse 4. And you'll remember that Jesus from heaven speaking to Saul said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It wasn't just in simply the things that he said, but also in the things that he did. Jesus is going to speak about the human heart and about human words. He's going to reveal to us that what we say becomes a picture 
and also an invitation about who we are. What we say with our mouths reveals something about who we are in the very core of our being. Jesus holds the religious leaders responsible for what they've said about him. Did you realize that the words you say to the people that you love and that the people that you don't love really do make a difference? It's really interesting how early it begins in life when my granddaughter Jaden was, I was holding her and she was, she, was, she was stroking my face. She was doing one of those granddaughter things and she looked at me and she goes, Papa, you're beautiful. <laughs> now I really want to believe with all my heart she meant it. That she wasn't just doing it to try to manipulate me. That she really meant it. It really makes a difference what you say. What you say publicly, what you say privately. Some of us may have entertained the notion in the past that words don't make that big of a difference, but Jesus thinks that words do make a difference. There are words of blasphemy that, we can, that can apparently be forgiven. There are certain things, at least one specific things, that, that apparently can't be forgiven in verses 31 through 32. We use words when we confess Christ or deny Christ in verse 33. Our words expose our heart in verse 34 and 35. Our words will be held accountable in verse 36. Our words determine our destiny in verse 37. Most of you aren't old enough to remember, but years and years ago, CBS released the tragic story of singer and songwriter Karen Carpenter. Some of you who are old like me remember Richard and Karen Carpenter. Karen died unexpectedly of congestive heart failure at the age of 32. It was brought on by years of self-abuse from an eating disorder. But what brought on Karen's fatal obsession with weight control? It seems that early in their career, a reviewer once called her Richard's chubby sister. But you know what? She never forgot those words. Those words began to dominate her thinking. The words began to control her life. And then those words became her life. And then she allowed those words to take her life. Augustine called words those precious cups of meaning. It's true that words are often subjective. It's true that words often change their meaning with time. In 1675, Sir Christopher Wren laid the first foundation stone that was going to become his masterpiece, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And for 35 years, he labored on this massive project. And in 1710, he presented it to his sovereign, Queen Anne. And England's grand monarch pronounced it artificial, amusing, awful. Sir Christopher Wren was delighted. You see, in 1710, the word artificial meant artful. Amusing meant amazing. And awful meant full of awe and awe-inspiring. Wouldn't that be great if some of our TV commentators, as they look at the presidential campaigns, go, I found the candidate artificial, amusing, and awful. <laughs> it, it depends, doesn't it? But words have meaning. And words have consequences. And so in verse 33, Jesus is, is going to invite us with a little parable of the human heart. Jesus will say, either make the tree good or, or make the, its fruit good. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. So Jesus, in the context in which we've already spoken, speaks of plants and poisonous serpents. 
But first, he invites us to examine the fruit tree. Again, what is the context? The Pharisees have accused Jesus of being energized by demons, possibly even the chief demon. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus spoke of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves in chapter 7 verse 15. Jesus said in chapter 7, you'll know them by their fruit. Again, he said, even so every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bad fruit in chapter 7 verses 16 and 17. So Jesus is stating something that is obvious. It's something that's well known. It's an earthly picture that would have been very much real to everyone who is listening to him. Remember what a parable is. A parable is an earthly story that communicates a spiritual truth or a heavenly truth. So here Jesus is going to use the tree as human life. Remember in the book of Psalms it says that, that he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of, of water that, that bring forth fruit in its season in Psalm chapter 1 verse 3. So what does Jesus mean when he says either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad? I'm going to suggest to you in the context, in the culture, Jesus is using a picture of horticulture. Human beings for literally centuries had been engaged in developing and cultivating fruit to make it desirable and plentiful. It's well known both in Egypt and throughout the Middle East that they would take certain citrus trees and they would take certain fruit trees and, and certain olive trees and they would cultivate them. And as they're cultivating the tree, they're doing it to make the fruit desirable and plentiful. And if they come across a tree that is bad, if its fruit is defective, then they are going to cut it off. The religious leaders should have known What's going on? The religious leaders should have been able to admit that the healing that Jesus had done, the paralysis that he made whole, the healing of the demonized man, all of the things that Jesus had done up until this point, they weren't bad things, they were good things. Jesus is doing good. And the religious leaders accuse Jesus of doing evil. Once again, Jesus is pointing out their inconsistency. He's asking them to simply acknowledge what they know to be true. That the quality of the fruit in a given tree is going to be reflective by what that tree actually produces. And so what is the fruit of Jesus' ministry? Jesus has healed the sick. Jesus has raised the dead. Jesus has released the captive. Jesus has driven out demons. Jesus is in effect saying, how could a corrupt tree produce such marvelous fruit? Why do the religious leaders persist in such an irrational position? And so it is when we invite people to look into the life of Jesus and into the ministry of Jesus, into the love of Jesus, into the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And we, we simply say, don't just simply look at what he said, look at what he did and now explain it. And so he, he continues with a people with an evil heart. Look what Jesus says in, in his rebuke, you brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? Jesus gives the reason. The religious leaders aren't just poisonous trees producing poisonous fruit. But now Jesus is going to be guilty of mixing his metaphors. Brood of vipers. He calls the religious leaders a snake pit. And the statement of Jesus is both an accusation and an observation. 
In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the Lord has already revealed through the prophet Jeremiah that the heart, the human heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Psalm 51, 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul wrote, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible's reoccurring message is that there's something wrong, there's something flawed, there's something wicked, there's something broken inside of us that needs to be fixed. The solution for a bad heart is a new heart. In order for the bad heart to go away, it's going to require a new heart. Vipers were dangerous and deceptive. Their venom was poisonous. And they blend easily into the scenery. Some of you may remember in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where Paul and a group of shipwrecked adventurers find themselves on the island of Malta. And it was raining and, and the weather was particularly bad. And the people of the island of Malta put together a bonfire and they began to build a fire. And, and Paul stuck his hand into a wood pile and out came a viper, a snake. And the people on the island of Malta said, he has been spared justice by the sea, but apparently this man is a murderer because he's not going to escape justice by the snake. And the people expected Paul to blow up and die, but God saved him. And then, then the people of Malta said, wow, he must be a God of some sort to be spared. We sometimes stick our hand into the woodpile of truth and unexpectedly we find a snake fastened for the journey. So Jesus is making a powerful statement. How can wicked people say good things? And I know that that's exactly all of your opinion as you watch the presidential debates. How can wicked people say good things? But you're desperately wanting to hear something good, aren't you? You're desperately want, you, you want the candidates to be able to say, why won't you focus on the issues? Why won't you focus on the needs? Why won't you do what you're supposed to do? You may even think that Jesus is being unkind or unfair. Well, look what Jesus, he's calling the religious leaders a brood of vipers. That, that's not a very kind thing to say. But remember, Jesus is speaking the truth. Jesus is incapable of doing anything other than speaking the truth. I've told you the story of the little old lady at church who seemed to have a kind thing to say about every single person. And it got so frustrating to the pastor. He says, I think you would find something kind to say about the devil. And she said, well, you do have to admire his persistence. All the evidence in the text indicates that the religious leaders who have accused Jesus of manipulating, controlling, deceiving is in fact themselves the ones who are controlled and manipulated and deceived. That they're the ones who exist to undermine God's plan. So how do we find balance in our own speech? How do we do what the Bible invites us? To do, to speak the truth, but to speak the truth in love. One of the things that I think we have to come to grips with is we have to come to grips with the fact that apart from God's moral goodness, apart from the word of God, apart from the fellowship of the saints, apart from the revelation that's given to us by the word of God, most of us aren't capable of saying things that are encouraging, wholesome, and edifying. We're on safe ground when we conclude that each of us is capable, not of the best kind of speech, but of the worst kind of speech. And that sometimes even the things that we say has the ability to break a person's world to pieces. Something that you might have said offhandedly, something that maybe you didn't give a second thought to. Can you imagine growing up in a world where your parents get divorced 
or one parent isn't in the picture, and you overhear your father say, how long am I going to have to be punished for a mistake that I made 10 years ago or 15 years ago? And you realize you're the one, you're the mistake that they're talking about. Do you think that has an effect on a child? We have this unbelievable ability to hurt each other. Alexander White, quoting John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress, said, quote, Sin and corruption would bubble up out of my heart as naturally as water bubbles out of a fountain. I thought now that everyone had a better heart than I had. I could have changed hearts with anybody. I thought none but the devil himself could equal me for inward wickedness and pollution of mine. I felt, therefore, at the sight of my own vileness deeply into despair. For I concluded that this condition which I was in could not stand with a life of grace. Sure, thought I, I'm forsaken of God. Sure, I am given up to the devil and to a reprobate mind, unquote. Sometimes we think, how could I possibly have said that? How could I have possibly have done that? How could I have possibly have been so cruel and so unkind? And Jesus gives the explanation in verse 34. Look what it says. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The word abundance here means overflow. He's talking about it's as if there's something inside of you and then all of a sudden it starts to bubble out and it overflows from your heart and it spills over on whatever shores you happen to land on. The picture is almost the picture of a population group of people as the population grows and grows and they spill out over the borders and they take over the landscape. And so what Jesus is basically saying is that what's inside of you will eventually wash out. A man's words exposes a man's heart, verse 34, a viper, good or evil, verse 35. We have a commercial in our culture and our society where they say, what's in your wallet? Here, the Bible is basically asking you the question, what's in your heart? What's inside of there? What's going to come out? The mouth seems to lower the bucket into the well of the human heart. So Jesus is in effect reminding the religious leaders. What you have said reveals the truth about what you are. And so Jesus is presenting something that each and every one of us intuitively know to be true. Our words reveal the moral and spiritual condition of our heart. The, the heart means the person. The heart is who you are at the deepest level. The root reveals the fruit. Doing comes from being. Moral decisions determine identity and destiny. And so now Jesus is digging into the very essence of what it means to be a human being. What it means to be a person. And no one is capable of good. Unless God makes him good. Unless God gives us the ability and the capability. In Luke chapter 18, verse 18, you'll remember the story of the rich young ruler. It says, a certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response to the question is, why is it that you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Think about what Jesus is saying in that very simple statement. He's basically saying either he's not God and therefore not good or that he is God and that he is good. Frederick Dale Bruner hits the nail on the head. He says, quote, in context, Jesus is telling the Pharisees why their speech borders on being the unforgivable sin against the spirit. The reason is not insufficient prudence or flawed diplomacy. It's bad being. The Pharisees' slandering of Jesus and his spirit, quote, are not accidents. They correspond to what the adversaries of Jesus are, evil. The religious leaders are 
bad to the bone. And that's upsetting to some people. The idea <laughs> that you could be that bad. <clears throat> the point, we're all capable of hurting, damaging, thoughtless, insensitive speech. So how can we avoid it? Well, we have to fill our hearts with the new treasures of speech. In verse 35, it says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. I love that word treasure in verse 35. It's elsewhere translated in Matthew's gospel. Remember when the wise men show up and they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they bring it out of their treasure. The word is an interesting word in the original language. It's the word thesaurus. Some of you know that word because a thesaurus is a book. It's a compilation of word. In, in my work and in my world, a thesaurus is a treasure book because in it I find all of the tools that I need to come up with just the right word at just the right time. And that's what Jesus is saying. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. We can only have a good heart if we give our bad heart to God. And we allow God by the power of his spirit, by the transformation of the Holy Spirit to give us a good heart. What happens when we honor God with our heart and with our speech and with our lips. Our heart changes, our words change, our deeds change. Sometimes even our countenance changes. That means sometimes our, our very face will begin to reflect what's going on inside of your heart. I've told you the story that sometimes when I'll go to McDonald's, I'll just go, sausage biscuit. And they'll go, what are you smiling about? And I'll go, because I'm about to get a sausage biscuit. No, no, really, why, why are you smiling? Okay, I'm going to admit it. I wake up every morning and I think, I'm going to heaven and not, not to hell. Do you understand how good news that is? Do you understand how when your heart informs your face that you're going to heaven instead of hell, it has this way of transforming your life? We can't possess goodness if there's no goodness inside of us. Jesus is going to bring out a principle. We will produce what we possess. The good treasure of the heart is in the center of our moral being. And so Jesus has already pointed out to us that our speech is the test of character. Someone on my radio program said, there's no religious test in order to run for the presidency of the United States. And I said, that's true. There is no religious test. But shouldn't there be a character test? Shouldn't we elect leaders who, who embrace some semblance of decency and morality and character? Let me just be blunt. Would you let any of these people watch your children after school? <laughs> See, you're laughing, but you're starting to get it. If you have minimum requirements for people to watch your children... Shouldn't there be minimum requirements of who leads? Our speech is the test of our character. And once again, I miss my grandma. I miss my grandma. She comes to the rescue. Granny, when I was growing up, she would say, keep your words soft and sweet. You never know when you're going to have to eat them. And she was right, wasn't she? Keep your words soft and sweet. You never know when you might have to eat them. Isn't it amazing the power of the spoken word? Can you imagine going to a restaurant and you go, hey, 
what would you like for dessert? Oh, I can't eat another bite. Oh, I can't put another morsel in my mouth. Oh, I, I think I'm full. And the, then the waiter says, the dessert comes with the meal. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you hear pistachio ice cream. <laughs> I'll have red velvet cake. I'll have chocolate, lava, 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 let the chocolate flow. <laughs> Isn't it funny how your whole perspective changes with just one insight? Wisdom is knowing when to speak your mind, but also when to mind your speech. Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 20, 29, let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth. The word translated foul or corrupt is the Greek word sapros. It means rotten. It means putrid. It means polluting. It's a word that would describe fruit that had gone completely rotten. And would you put that in your mouth? Paul says, but speak what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Paul told the Christians in Ephesus to put away unwholesome speech and vulgarity and lewdness and slander and obscene talk. Those were the expressions of a life lived before you came to Christ. These aren't the words that you speak because you know and love the Lord. There is a time, there does come a time in your life where you go, you know what? Those were words for a different time and a different circumstance. This isn't who I am. The Holy Spirit can convict us of unhealthy talk and give us words that will help us build each other up or tear each other down. And so according to the Bible, speech can include the purpose of sharing good things, building and strengthening people, ministering grace. And when the Bible talks about you use your speech to minister grace, it means favor. It means blessing. It means you provide comfort and you provide hope. And then in verse 36, a punishment concerning their heart. Look what it says in verse 36. But I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account of it in the day of judgment. So Jesus points out that words fall into several categories. Those that are useful and those that are useless. There's conversations that tear people down. There's conversations that build people up. But according to Jesus, our words are something that we're accountable to the Lord. And it may come as a shock and a surprise to you, but in verse 36, the word that I'm going to draw to your attention might not be the one that you want the most information about. When Jesus says, but I say to you, it's, it's singular. And, and let me tell you what I mean by that. It's as if everyone in the crowd has disappeared. The disciples are gone. The religious leaders are gone. The standing people standing by are gone. It's, it's, it's as if you and Jesus are alone together because guess what? The religious leaders are now gone and the other people are gone and everybody else is gone. And Jesus is turning the lights out everywhere. And the only person who is left talking and speaking is you. 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 And him. Jesus is bringing to our attention that he himself becomes the judge. William MacDonald writes, quote, because the words people have spoken are an accurate gauge of their lives, they will form a suitable basis for condemnation or acquittal. How great will be the condemnation of the Pharisees for the vile and contemptuous words which they spoke against God's holy son, unquote. According to Jesus, our words are accountable to the Lord. According to Jesus, every word that we speak becomes 
part of the accountability. Jesus reminds the religious leaders, you give an account and you'll make justification for your words. The word translated idle is very interesting. It's a ergos. The, the root word is ergos, which speaks of energy, and a is no energy, but in the context then, it means idle, lazy. It, it was used to describe someone who is unemployed or a person who didn't do any work at all. But the implication in the past seems to be a word that you and I might think of as is useless. It's a word that has no value or won't accomplish anything. Sometimes we'll use words to describe those words. We, we use the term small talk or we, 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 we refer to words that won't amount to anything. And so Jesus is in effect saying, your words amount to something each and every time, even though you may feel that they're light or inconsequential. What we say in the unguarded moments, what we say in the unfiltered moments, what we say in the moments where we don't allow the guard and the filter. But Jesus basically says, guess what? The words that you speak affect the present and they affect the future, because Jesus points out that every idle word spoken will one day pass the judgment bar. What seemed like an insignificant slip of the tongue becomes an invitation to judgment. At this point, you should ask a different question, I think. You should ask the question, why does God judge our words? And according to Jesus, because our words are the accurate gauge of our heart. So we ask the question again, why does God judge our words? Because God judges our heart. Why does he judge our heart? Because our heart is an accurate reflection of our character. One of our former presidents had a top aide who was in the nightly news and when asked the question about the president keeping promises, the aide said, this president kept every promise that he intended to keep. Yeah. See, we laugh. Sometimes out of the abundance of the heart, it leaks out. I kept every promise I said that I would keep or that I intended to keep. What you say in public reveals who you are in private, but what you say in private and public will determine who you are forever. You know, in the movie Contact, some of you may have, have seen it, it was written by Carl Sagan, and it featured Jodie Foster. And uh, the premise of the movie was that ancient TV broadcasts of Hitler's Reich was broadcast into outer space, and, and everything that's spoken on this planet starts going out into sound waves and video waves that never cease. They may diminish in intensity, but they go on forever and ever and ever. And I read about a news broadcast in Chicago that was interrupted with, some of you are old enough to remember, it's howdy doody time. It's howdy doody time. It's howdy doody time. Now, those of you who don't predate the 1950s have no idea what I'm talking about. But apparently, scientists believe that howdy doody broadcasts went out into space, hit some sort of celestial object, and then began to bounce back some 30 plus years later. What's interesting about that is, again, according to science, your words go on and on and on like the Energizer Bunny, only worse. The batteries never go dead. Long after your body is dead, your words go on. And God has something of a, of a permanent accounting record. There seems to be a digital, audio, video. There seems to be several different versions of your life restore, stored forever. The big question that you should be asking is, how do I get rid of that? 
How do I make that film go away? That's the gospel. The gospel is the story of how God is willing to forgive your sins in Christ Jesus. It, it says in verse 37, for by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. What does that mean? For by your words you'll be justified You're, and by your words you'll be condemned. The Lord Jesus has paid the penalty for careless speech on the cross of Calvary. That's the good news. Jesus has paid the penalty For specific speech, careless speech, hurtful speech, Jesus suggests that our very words will serve as a witness which will either judge us or condemn us. So what does Jesus mean when he says, for by your words you'll be justified? Remember what the word justified means. It's a word which means declared right in the sight of God. Is he indicating that you're saved some way other than by grace through faith and that not of yourself? That's not what he's indicating at all. Good words are indicative of a good treasure, verse 35. Words that dismiss Jesus are indicative of an evil heart. Here I think that Jesus is acknowledging that what we say about Jesus is either going to be true or untrue. It's going to be accurate or inaccurate. It's going to be helpful or not helpful. Emerson said, a man is what he thinks about all day long. The Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius put it this way, quote, a man's life is what his thoughts make of it. William James, the great philosopher said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by the attitudes of their mind, unquote. In the Bible, we find that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What do you think in your heart, about your life, about your salvation, about grace, about mercy. The apostle Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Your speech reveals who you are. Your speech reveals what you are. Your speech reveals where you'll go. You know, it's been estimated that most people will speak in one week as many words as it would take to fill a large 500-page book. In the average lifetime, that amounts to 3,000 volumes. That means you will have spoken 1,500,000 pages of words. It's kind of frightening when you think that when you open a book that's 1,500,000 pages... And from that book, you're either justified or condemned. All of a sudden, you begin to understand, perhaps in a way that you never knew, just how important your words are. How would you characterize your speech? Are they words of truth? Are they vain words, like in Ephesians 5, 6? Enticing words, Colossians 2, 4? Or wholesome words, like 1 Timothy 6, 3, and sound words in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. The only way that you can get rid of your old heart is to have a new one. And that's what God promises you in Christ. A new heart so that you can have a new way of speaking and a new way of living. I read the story of two boys who were on a playground and they were discussing a classmate and one of them said, he's no good at sports. And the other responded quickly, yep, yeah, but you know what? He always plays fair. The critical one said, 
He isn't smart in school either. And his friend replied, that may be true, but he studies hard. He makes every effort. And the boy with the mean tongue was becoming exasperated with the attitude of the other. Well, he said, did you ever notice how ragged his clothes are? And the other boy kindly said, yeah, but have you ever noticed that they're always clean and they're always pressed? It just takes a word. It takes one word to steer the conversation in a different direction. And so the Bible invites you to speak gracious words, wholesome words, grace-filled words. The words of Jesus are lasting words, and the words of Jesus are living words, and the words of Jesus are inspiring words. When I was in high school, my my grandma would help me with my speeches. And I'd say, Granny, how can I end this? And she said, I love a finished speaker. Yes, indeed I do. I don't mean one who's polished. I just mean one who's through. No. Just say the end. The end. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that as we consider our heart, that some of us might need some radical changes and replacements. Lord, we know that the passage itself says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And for some of us, that might mean that we need a new heart one that's filled with gracious words, one that's filled with wholesome words, one that's filled with blessing and thanksgiving. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that out of the thesaurus, out of the treasure of our heart, we would speak words that are going to bring life, love, healing, and hope. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his love. Thank you that we have the ability to have the words that we've spoken, forgiven. And Lord, we also pray that those forgiven words could become forsaken. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.